If you're ready, Annie, uh, we'll get started. I'm ready. Let's do it. So let's talk about your current role right now and share with us a little bit about your past experience in HR. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm on week four of my, my job at at Hi Bob, so uh, I'm still getting my feet wet. Um, but my my role and and what I expect to be doing over the next several months and 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 longer um, is really focused on twofold. So Hi Bob's been around for about six years, based in in Israel. Um, so the company and the infrastructure is largely built out for um, for that team, but the U.S. is still very much in startup mode. Um, so my focus is, is going to be on building that, that uh, HR infrastructure here in the U.S. and making sure that we're leveraging the Bob platform to the, um, in the best way that we can um, for our U.S. market. And then the other really big focus for me uh, in my new role is, is really around culture. So similarly, we have a really amazing and well-established culture in Israel, but uh, most of our team in the U.S. is new. So figuring out how we drive that culture, uh, especially knowing that more than half of our staff is, is going to be hybrid or re fully remote. So how do we establish a great culture both in the office as well as for our remote teams? Um, so that's my role today. Again, still sort of defining what it will look like long term. Um, but prior to this, I worked at, um, I, I led uh, HR at a digital out-of-home media company called Captivate. Um, which is a 25-year-old company um, and had been around a long time, but a lot of their HR programming was, was stuck in the past. Um, so I put in place a lot of uh, more modern programs around performance management, uh, engagement surveys, and really establishing the HR function as a strategic one rather than just a, an operational one. Um, and as you read in my bio, prior to, to Captivate, I uh, worked at Namely, which is uh, ironically another HR tech company, um, and Notel, which was a, a flex office provider, um, and I and a, a global one. So we were operating in 15 different countries, rapid growth. Uh, so I learned a lot very, very quickly. Um, and, and that's sort of the, the history that led me to where I am today. So before we dive into questions, how big is Bob right now? And, and then if you can tell us the number, like employee count, but what's the split in terms of uh, Israel or, you know, Europe globally versus the U.S.? Yeah, so we have about 320 people globally. Uh, in the U.S., we've got, and, and I'm, I'm thinking as I'm talking because the number is updating literally every day. Um, in the U.S., we've got, I think, 60 people today, um, and about 30 of them are in New York. So a really uh, dispersed staff. Awesome. Well, let's get to it. I, I wanted to ask you, how have you seen the COVID-19 pandemic impact the 2021 and the 2020 sorry, the 2021 and the 2020 workplace, and then maybe you move it into 2022. What are, sure. what are your thoughts here? Yeah, uh, it's a, a loaded question. So much has changed and I'm sure everyone on this call feels it too. Um, so I think the, the biggest change that we've all felt is most companies are either hybrid or fully remote or maybe having people come in a, a little bit, but largely um, in, in that hybrid setup. Um, and what that's meant for the workplace is there's needed to be a much bigger focus and, and um, intention around how we communicate and how we collaborate. Um, the the mm -hmm. notion of catching up at the coffee machine is is no longer a, a, something that we have um, you know to do. So um, having more structure for for managers really. Um, setting up norms, sticking with their one-on-one -on -one schedules, sticking with their team meetings, and and making sure that employees feel supported um, because they're, they, again, aren't in person. Um, and then the other thing I think that's really important is that managers really need to trust that their employees are doing what they say they're doing. Um, we used to, you know, have this mindset that if we can't see each other and if they're not in from nine to five, they're not working. Um, obviously, we've all learned over the last year and a half that we can get our jobs done from home. Um, so, so, instilling that sense of trust between manager and employee um, uh, it, it has, has been a huge change, I think. I, I agree. And I was with a group of CEOs a couple of weeks ago and they're growing their organizations. And, and because I'm the HR lady in the room with a, with an organization myself, they said, what, what tracking hourly tracking tool are you using to monitor your employees? And I was like, what? I don't, 
I don't do those things. Um, right. I set expectations and then I hold them accountable. Like if, if they aren't in their, they aren't doing their job. So I, I think that a lot of managers are struggling with this because they feel like if you see the person, then that means that they're working. But especially when you're dealing with global organizations, that's just really not possible. Yeah. And, and I think um, this is where, like you said, setting expectations, goal setting is really valuable. Um, it should be about outcomes and not, not, uh, or work product as opposed to the things that you're doing to achieve that end. Um, and, and I think that's been a shift culturally for a lot of companies. So when, so we're making the shift to this remote or hybrid. And when we asked the group earlier today, the majority here are remote or hybrid. Uh, there were a few that have been, there was no change. They were, I guess, an essential business. And so always in the office, but I wanted to ask you now that we're moving to more of this remote and hybrid workplace going forward, how is this impacting the onboarding process and the onboarding experience for employees in your opinion? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think about this question twofold. So when I think about what makes an effective onboarding, there's um, the, the, the logistics of making sure the employee has what they need on their first day. They're set up in all the systems. They um, have clear expectations about their role and, and their team. Um, and then the other really important piece that's often unfortunately overlooked is, is the experience itself and, and get, giving that employee um, a sense that they've made a really great decision in coming to this company. They believe in the, comp- the, the values and they, they feel connected to the business, the vision and, and the team. Um, so both of those have been much more challenging in a ro- remote or hybrid atmosphere. Um, and one of the things I've learned very quickly just in my first few weeks at Hi Bob is, um, you know, we're hiring rapidly um, and we're still figuring, working out the kinks of just getting the logistics organized. So um, partnership with IT is really, really essential, I'm, I'm finding. And I've always had, had tight contact with IT, um, but now more than ever, making sure that the laptop arrives on time and that they can log into their computer so that they can join the first orientation session. Um, so you, we need to be much more buttoned up than we've ever been before when it comes to getting the, the really simple things ready for their first day. Cause it's not, they're not showing up to an office uh, with the computer on their desk and it in the room to help them get logged in. Um, so that's, that's on the, the logistics side of the house. Um, and then from the, the perspective of, um, you know, building that connection and, and getting the employee feeling really excited about, about their decision to join this new company. Um, what, uh, what I think ha- is really important is that you, we're again, very intentional about creating opportunity for, for that connection. So you may not be able to take the new empl- employee out to lunch on their first day, but are you setting aside an hour for everyone to have a virtual lunch? Lunch, Maybe you send um, the new hire a gift card to order their, their lunch on their first day and sit down and talk with the team about something that's not work-related, just so they can get to know each other and feel like they, they know their team and are excited about the people they'll be working with. I love that. And I will say that it was hard before the pandemic to be able to make sure that I had employee logins and, and, and my people had access to the things that they needed to do even after employee orientation. But now that we have so many remote workers, just getting that computer to them is uh, remains, remains a challenge. So it, it feels like not that that makes, you know, the experience any better for anybody, but kind of in solidarity, we're all going through <laughs> similar situations as we hire and onboard and bring new people in our companies. Definitely. So I wanted to talk about scaling because this is an area that you have a lot of expertise and experience in. So how has company growth impacted your HR and people initiatives as organizations that you've worked with and then looking at Bob and, and how they're growing? Um, how has that changed? Yeah, I think, so what I'm about to share, I think has been trending for a very long time, but with uh, the recent changes of the last year and a half have, have, have escalated, um, this need to be much more agile as a company. Um, so the, the days of the annual performance review uh, is like no longer, no longer relevant when you're hiring, you know, 50 people a month or even in a six month period, looking, doing a 12 month look back at performance is, is not relevant anymore. So having lighter touch, more, more agile processes when it comes to, again, performance management, employee surveys, 
um, and not making them a huge two month process, if they can really operate in the flow of work um, and, and you know, with, with surveys, for example, at, at HiBOP, we're doing them every two months. Um, we actually have a survey live right now, and we're going to flip flip around the results next week at our all hands meetings. So it doesn't need to be a, you know, a several week process to analyze the data, figure out your action items and share them. It, it employees will feel much more valued when they're, they get that quick turnaround on, okay, this, this feedback I gave you was heard. And, and here's what this, you know, the summary of the results are. And then we can, you know, get to them a, a week later with what are the actions we're taking. But a lot of times that, that information goes into a black hole and it's never heard again. Um, I'm going a little off, off, off in, in the deep end right now, but basically staying agile, keeping these processes light touch um, so that they, they grow and, and change with your company. I, I will tell you, so I've been in HR for 20 years and the first employee engagement survey that we did, and, and I worked for initially for a lot of fortune, um, 200 companies, fortune fifties, and the process for the old way of employee engagement surveys was sometimes I, as the, as the HR person in the field, wouldn't get information back from that survey three to five months after it had happened. So the fact that you're able to move so quickly, one week later, you know, mention this at the completion of the survey in the all hands meeting, I feel like we have to move this quickly moving forward. It doesn't matter what size company it is, but in order to make sure that it's timely and relevant, this is really critical. Uh, the other thing uh, I just want to call it in the comments is someone said that IT deserves a medal uh, for remote employee support. I feel like HR needs a medal for remote employee support too. So let's not um, forget our HR peeps, but H IT certainly. And then I love that you're mentioning agile. I, I think this is something that HR people should, should be thinking more about. So if you're not familiar with agile, maybe um, could you talk a little bit about how you're using that in HR? For the organiz for the organization, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think um, again, going back to the, the old school way of doing performance reviews, it used to be you know five questions. People were writing essays, um, looking back at their full you know the last twelve months. Um, an agile performance review process might be you know uh, two questions: what's going well, what's not going well, and maybe maybe you know. Uh, actions that you'll be taking over the next quarter, next six months. Um, but it, it uh, rather than, again, being a, a, something that takes a month to three months to complete, it's something that someone could sit down and complete in, in a 30 minute window, submit to their, their manager and have a conversation the next week. Um, but something that's really timely and, and, and relevant to the experience that they're going through and they can get quick feedback, pivot if they're not, if something's not going well, um, they don't need to wait a year to find out that their manager has an issue with, with something that they did. It's a forcing mechanism for, for more regular feedback. Perfect. Perfect. And I just, um, we have been doing agile at, at, Workology, and I just finished an Agile book. The name is escaping me right now, but I feel like uh, the Agile book had a lot of workplace and employee engagement strategies in, but that's not what the book was about. It really was about Agile itself. So I will make sure to include this book because I felt like it was a really good read um, in the email recap that we're going to send you a little bit later today. So y'all can, can have maybe a new book if you are looking for more resources and Agile Personally, I think it is smart for HR to follow suit with, um, especially given all the, the things that, that we have been dealing with it as HR leaders. So let me move on to the next question, because this is a big one. Um, and, you know, I've, I, you're just a few weeks in, so I do want to pivot here in a little bit and ask you a question about like how you're prioritizing what you're doing. But um, the question I want to ask right now is how are you promoting a culture of well-being, productivity, and a sense of belonging uh, at Bob and, and maybe in other organizations that you've worked with? Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, the, the most important thing is that if you're saying that you're a company that cares about well-being and you care about your employees, your leaders better be practicing that themselves. Um, so whether so, set standards as a company around what are your norms on, on communications? What are your 
work hours. And if you have to get information from someone outside of those hours, what are the standards for doing so? Um, is your man is your manager sending emails late at night or on the weekends unnecessarily? Um, if so, that's going to send the wrong message to your employees. So really making sure that managers and leaders are modeling the behavior that that um, the company is is saying they care about. Um, and then another really important thing I think is. Um, when employees go through personal challenges, this last year and a half has has I, I know I've I've been on the receiving end of hearing about a lot of you know personal things that that employees have gone through related to COVID, childcare, um, you know, just family things, um, and the way that the company reacts to those challenges is so important. Um, just being human, checking in with them when, when you find out something, uh, you know, someone's gone through something difficult, um, making sure that you're giving them the space to, to cope and deal with them, uh, with those challenges and letting them know that you're there to support them. Um, it's not complicated stuff. It's just being an empathetic leader. And that, that can be from HR, it can be from the manager and it can be from the, the leadership team. Um, but those are the types of things that build engagement and buy-in and, and connection to a company more than anything else. You can, you know, you can, you can um, you know, roll out a, a wellness app or online therapy, give a subscription to, to text therapy apps or things like that. And that's all well and good. But if your, your behaviors and your, um, your actions aren't matching up with that, it's, it's all sort of for naught. And, and do you feel like you as 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 the head of, of HR um, are is there I'm assuming yes but there's a focus for you on modeling those behaviors so that other managers will will follow suit and and if so how are you communicating to them uh, through that what what you'd like to see yeah um, so I and start in my past roles and now in my new role, um, having having touch points, touch bases with managers to understand what sort of challenges um, they're facing with their employees. Um, you know, just just yesterday, uh, I learned about there's an employee whose um, whose childcare, their daycare was was closed down because of a, a potential COVID case, and they emailed their boss and said, "I don't know, uh, you know." I'm not going to be able to work with my toddler at home. What do I do? Um, so I'm going to be sitting down with that manager and say, all right, let's think about what's fair. We want to, we want to be reasonable here. This person, we know they have a lot of, you know, important work to do, but their, their family comes first. And how are we going to model that behavior with them? So coach, you know, talking through, um, you know, reasonable solutions that will make sure the employee feels supported and that we actually care about who they are as a person. Um, I think it's just making sure to build that trust with managers from an HR standpoint so that they, they understand what, what the company's stance is on these things and they feel comfortable relaying that message to the employee. You're on mute. I think this piece is uh, really important because I don't, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want people feeling like they're going to the principal's office when, when we're having a conversation about maybe like the situation that you described. So you want to hear their points of view too, but reinforce that, you know, what the, what is really important for the culture and the kind of organization um, that, that, that Hi Bob wants to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I I think there was, I felt this at my last company. Um, there were several employees who I spoke to during the course of um, the pandemic who said, I've never come to HR about things in the past. Like this is the most I've ever spoken to HR. Um, but it what they weren't coming to me to complain and I wasn't, you know, scolding them for anything. It was, let's talk person to person. What are you going through and how can we help you through this um, while still, you know, supporting the needs of the business that that doesn't go away, but what's a reasonable, how can help us help you <laughs> to, to use a, a, you know, silly phrase, but like at the end of the day, the, the employee will tell you what their, what solution they think could work. And, and oftentimes they come up with a good solution. We don't have to have all the answers as HR. Um, we just have to be, you know, hear them out and, and help come to a, a solution that, um, you know, makes sense for, for both sides. So 
so how do you make time for those kind of conversations? Because I think that if you're a small team or you're scaling quickly, like there's a lot of moving parts in, in different places. So how do you make time still to get the things that you need to do done, uh, but also make time to support employees and those managers? Still figuring that out, um, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, I mean, I think the the first check, whenever employees come to me with, with problems and, or with challenges with their manager, my first advice is always start with your manager, like share these things with them directly first before escalating to HR, because we can't support every single individual employee situation as they come up. Um, but we can serve as an escalation point if that manager can't resolve it in, in a, an effective way. Um, there will never be enough time in the day, especially lately with, with, you know, the, the extra challenges that we're now facing as, as HR leaders, but um, empowering managers to be able to handle these situations effectively is, is a good start. I love, I love that you're saying that because I think that a lot of times we think all employee questions need to come to us and then we get overwhelmed. We have too many things on our plate, but a lot of these if managers feel empowered, uh, they can help work, support the employees with their questions. And so then if it needs to be escalated, it, it can go to you and, and your team. And then you're able to really focus on supporting the business the way that you're in outside of employee um, questions and concerns, kind of that employee relations side. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that, that I've really liked since I joined Hi Bob, Hi Bob is um, we do manager syncs um, and a U.S. leader sync every two weeks or so. So that's a good forum for if there are themes that I'm hearing or managers, themes that managers are experiencing. It's very likely that it's happening more broadly with, with other managers and I, maybe I haven't heard about it yet. Um, so that's a, those are good opportunities to align on, on what are some of the challenges we're experiencing? What are some tactics for addressing them? Um, so that they're not routing every individual challenge, you know, thing to, to HR, they can sort of understand the stance of the company and then relay that back to the employee. I want to switch gears uh, and talk a more about Hi Bob. Can you sh maybe share some examples about how Hi Bob customers use Bob to enhance the employee experience, especially during times of change and transformation? Sure. Um, yeah, so our, our sweet spot and the types of companies that we really target um, to, to use our product are those that fit the, the three M's. So we that's uh, mid-sized, uh, modern, and multinational, and those that are, are growing really quickly. Um, and companies that really care about employee culture and engagement, especially in this, this hybrid world where it's, it's especially hard to build that. Um, so one company that has really utilized the full scope of uh, the Bob platform is uh, VaynerMedia, probably many of you have heard of it. Um, they're a company that has a really strong culture, but they wanted a technology that would sort of align with that culture. Um, and so they use Bob in, in a number of different ways. Um, they're using the platform for our, our survey tool. Uh, during the pandemic, they used uh, the COVID-19, the, the, the work from home uh, survey to get a sense of how their employees were feeling about the work from home situation, uh, what challenges they were facing and, and, and how the company could better support them. Um, they used the performance management tool and goal setting uh, to align on, on expectations around performance um, and, and future, you know, future development. Uh, and they also use some of the, the more, more fun elements of the platform. Uh, we, we have, a, I, I don't know how much uh, you all have seen of the platform, but there's sort of the essentially a news feed where uh, employees could post kudos and shout outs. So um, even though they're not in person, when, when people do great work, when employees are, are um, you know, recognized by clients or close a big deal or, or do something great to support their colleagues, um, they can get a shout out on the, on the uh, homepage and, and get that, you know, provide that recognition. So VaynerMedia used it a lot for that. Um, and there's another really cool feature, which is you can, um, employees can update their profiles with their pronouns. Um, they can list off their, their hobbies and passions uh, and using a reporting tool within, uh, within the Bob platform, you can sort of group people and see uh, who has common interests and, and they use that to, to drive engagement and culture and, and that sense of belonging um, that, that they already had built um, prior to, to Bob, but it, it really just emphasizes and builds on that. 
I love that. And we have some good conversations in the chat too. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the bonus question and then I, I see um, at least one question. So if y'all have a question and, and I see Christina and Carmelita and Shenny and, and Felisa, Felicia, <laughs> Felicia, you're, I, I'm loving what you're, you guys, you're, you're talking about. So I'm going to move to our bonus question here um, for you, Annie, is looking ahead. How do you envision the 2020 workplace and and what do you think HR leaders and employees should be expecting in the next year? I know this is this question is is a lot to ask. <laughs> yeah, a uh, big question. I think we are going to see probably a continuation of of what's been happening over the last six ish months, which is more people are going to start coming back to the office. It may not be with the frequency. It's probably not going to be five days a week ever again, is my guess. Um, but a couple days a week, I think many companies will get back to that hybrid environment. I think um, there's still, there, there's nothing to, you can't beat in-person interaction. There, there's, there's no virtual replacement for that. Um, so I think um, the, the, the hybrid work environment is, is here to stay. Um, distributed workforces are, are very likely to, to continue to be a, a thing that um, companies will continue to hire remotely um, because they're going to realize that the talent is everywhere and not just in on the coasts and in major metropolitan areas. Um, so even if office culture is, is important to the companies, um, they, they will still have some degree of, of remote staff and, and they'll have to continue to build culture you, you know, with that in mind. It just makes it more challenging because you have three different options that that employees fall under, um, and and you have to do all aspects of employee life cycle with yeah. in those those three different places for sure. And the the one other thing, sort of a, a different angle to to answer this question, but I think employee well being will continue to be a really big theme. Um, mental health, uh, you know, work life balance. Now that we we've gotten a taste of of working from home and, and sort of making our own schedules, um, that's going to continue to matter a lot to employees, regardless of where they're working. Um, so companies will have to support that as well. We have a question from the audience and I'll be interested in your, in your response to this one as well from Carmelita and thank you. It says, when you work in a multi-location company, uh, Israel and US time zones, how are different, how does, your team and leadership handle this? It's, I mean, that's been a, an interesting wake up for me. I, you know, again, week four on the job. Um, this is the first company that I've worked for that's based, you know, where the headquarters are elsewhere. Um, I think the, the biggest thing is you really need to, uh, so in the three hours that we have, three days a week, four days a week uh, in common, it's basically between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Eastern that we overlap with, with Israel. Um, my boss lives in Israel. Um, so those, those two hours a day, Monday through Thursday are, are essential to, to really protect those hours to, to align with, um, with the Israel team. Um, and then we have a UK team. So I've got a little bit late, you know, we, we have hours a little bit later in the day to work, but really preserving those hours for, for that, um, collaboration across offices. And then the nice thing for, for us in, in the U.S. is we have the afternoons a little bit more open to, to, folk, to do some more heads down work. Um, but meetings are really my mornings are now meetings and my afternoons are heads down work. Um, so it's hard. There's there's no easy solution to it. But um, aligning going back to an earlier point I made, aligning on norms around how we communicate and when. Um, and my, my boss knows, you know, or I know I can WhatsApp my boss if I need her outside of those standard hours, but, but I'm really trying to, to respect, you know, their weekends in, in Israel, they work Sunday to Thursday, as opposed to Monday to Friday. Um, so, uh, we need to be creative in how we stay in touch and, um, being really, really strict and, and firm on when we have one-on-ones, let's really make use of that time because our time is limited. I love that you shared this and I, I love that you didn't say, Hey, I just start my work day at 4am because I feel like <laughs> a lot of people, yeah. the expectation might be to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, my days are starting a little a, earlier. I'm starting, sure. I used to be start, you know, New York life. I used to start my day at 9 30, 10. Now I'm starting at 8am, 8, 8, 9. 
Um, but I can handle that. I'm not starting at 4 a.m. That's for sure. I will tell you that I have done some consulting with a, a couple different com- companies in Israel, <laughs> Tel Aviv, and um, I, I made that mistake. That was me. I would get calls at five and I would take them. And I don't think, especially given like what I know now, like that doesn't make for a great work life situation when your schedule is completely uh, uprooted. It it doesn't, it doesn't work for your family and, and it probably doesn't work for you. So completely agree. Well, um, so I want to make sure, do we have any other questions from, from anybody out there? Uh, th- this has been a great conversation. We really, really fast, Annie. <laughs> the fast talker, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I think the time sped up while we were chatting, but uh, I would love, I, I would love to have you maybe back on the podcast once you've been able to breathe and kind of learn and explore and, um, had some time to do some planning. And then we can um, talk more about, uh, the HR team that you're building, the organizational structure, how you're supporting executives and, and, and employees, uh, globally, U S and, and Israel and, and in the UK, uh, maybe in a few months. I love that. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Let's give uh, Annie a uh, round of applause in the chat. Thank you. Thank you.